Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good to be with you today on this beautiful, sunshiny November morning. Uh, yeah, we, we were blessed with some really good weather until a few days ago, right? Uh, so I'm not complaining. But uh, I don't know about you, but I, I love a good mystery. Anybody else like a good mystery? You know, you just like, whether it's something you read or something you watch, right? Uh, does anybody remember the Hardy Boys books? Anybody read those books? Anybody uh, you, you see a picture? Does that look familiar to you? Uh, those are really popular. Uh, even as a kid, when I was young, I remember getting on my bike and I would bike around my neighborhood and we would imagine that we were helping the police solve uh, mysteries and we were, we were the kid cops of America. I mean, that's what, we, that's what we thought of ourselves. We just loved riding around and like just engaging in those mysteries. Now, does anybody remember the TV show, Unsolved Mysteries? Anybody remember that show? That show freaked me out. It, was, it felt so real. We could probably watch it now and laugh because some of those episodes. And, and, the, and the guy who would, you know, he's real serious, like, this is Unsolved Mysteries. So like, whoa. It's mysterious, amazing, right? The mysteries are always interesting. Uh, and then, of course, Benedict Cumberbatch, uh, he really, I, I think, got some traction in his career by playing the arrogant, eccentric, and brilliant Sherlock Holmes. That's how he really got his start. So mysteries are uh, engaging. They, they draw us in. They pique our interest. And today, we're going to see a mystery revealed What mystery? What mystery? Open your Bible to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to see this mystery revealed. I hope you have a Bible with you. Uh, I hope you grabbed one. Maybe you grabbed one off of the uh, the card as you came in. It's page 1037. If you're new to Community Church, I often push us to tell us what's in the text. We've got to have our eyes in the text. I don't want you to just you know, trust that I'm, well, I want you to trust that I'm telling you the truth, right? Like, I want you to trust that what I'm saying is, is from Scripture, but you can see it for yourself. That's the point. I want you to see it for yourself in the text. We're, we're navigating through this book of Ephesians verse by verse. So Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 13 is our text today. Now, what's interesting about this mystery is this mystery revealed actually has huge implications for our lives today. So we need to know what it is, and we need to know why it matters. So let's look at God's word together. There's three points in this message, three points. And it's interesting how it's structured. The first point is Paul's prayer begins. So Paul is going to pray. Paul's the human author of Ephesians. He's going to pray, and his prayer begins in verse 1. Let's just look at it, verse 1. For this reason... I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, stop. We're going to see why there's a stop here in a minute. Here in verse 1, Paul begins a prayer. He, he starts with the phrase, what? For this, what? What does it say? For this reason. For, for what reason? Well, we have to look back. We're not going to do it. We're going to read the, the, te- the passage, but he's really pointing back to what he just said in chapter 2. Uh, if you were here last week, you heard verses 11 through 22, and particularly what Paul has in mind, he says, for this reason, for the reason I just gave in the last couple of verses, so verses 19 through 22, especially where we talked about this horizontal reconciliation, that we can have reconciliation with one another, Jews and Gentiles brought together to become God's kingdom, God's family family, and God's temple. We saw this in verses 19 through 22. This is the good news, but this message for Paul has a cost. What's the cost? We see it in verse 1. Paul is a what? What does it say? He's a prisoner. He's in prison, chained to a guard 24 hours a day, seven days a week under Roman guard. Why is he in prison? He's in prison for the sake of the gospel, but notice who does Paul call himself a prisoner of? He doesn't call himself a prisoner of Rome. No, he doesn't call himself a prisoner of Caesar. Who does he call himself a prisoner of in verse 1? Help me out here. He says the prisoner of what? Of of who? He's a prisoner of Christ Jesus. That's interesting that he would say that. Why would he say that? Because Paul doesn't belong to Rome. His life is not about Rome. His life is about Christ. He has tied himself. He has become one with Christ. And so Christ is his master. He sees himself as a prisoner of Christ, a servant of Christ. 
And he also, he also attributes his imprisonment, it says at the end of verse 1, on behalf of you Gentiles. You see that? He's in prison because of you. Now, that might sound accusatory, but it's not. We'll see that through the text. Why is Paul in prison because of the Gentiles? Why, why is that? Well, because it's particularly the, the ministry that Paul has is to bring this gospel, this good news of Christ, to the Gentiles. And it's that reason that led him to become in prison. You might ask, Why? Well, he insisted as he's interacting with Jews that we need to bring this message, this law-free, this grace-alone message to the Gentiles. They too can be saved. And he got himself in hot water for it in Acts chapter 21. And the Jewish people uh, get, got enraged with him, particularly the, 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 uh, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law. And this mob broke out in the temple complex, and they took him out. They dragged him out. They dragged Paul out. They started beating him up, and then all of this shouting was happening. And the Roman soldiers were rushing to the scene. They grabbed Paul. They put him under arrest. And that's why Paul's in prison. You can read about it yourself in Acts chapter 21 at the end of that chapter. He's in prison for the sake of the Gentiles because he insisted on bringing the gospel to the Gentiles. This is Paul's commission. He, he says it in Acts 22, verse 21. Christ called Paul to bring this gospel to the Gentiles. That was his ministry. And it was a costly commission because what's happening? He's in prison. So here's the question. What commission has Christ given you and me? It might be costly, it may cost us something to speak the truth in love to our coworker, our boss, or our classmate. Is our commission to be a light to our family this holiday season? Perhaps God has put a friend in your life with whom you really need to share this good news, but it might cost us something. We need to be ready for that. Discipleship is costly. Now, will we be faithful to share this good news, even if it costs us something? For Paul, it cost him his freedom. He ended up in jail for the sake of the gospel. But let's, as church, let's be faithful to follow Christ, to be obedient no matter what the cost is. So we see that in verse 1, the beginning of verse 1. We see the beginning of Paul's prayer. But then we see, number 2, Paul's job, which is make the mystery known. So Paul essentially does a big transition in verse 2. We'll see it. Because otherwise, it doesn't make any sense, okay? So verse 2 and 3, Paul goes off. He says, look at verses 2 and 3. He says, assuming you have heard about the administration of God's grace that he gave me for you, the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I have briefly written above. Okay, now what's going on here? Paul digresses in verse 2. He starts in verse 1 with a thought. He starts with a prayer, and then he sort of cuts himself off, and he says, uh, assuming that you have heard about the administration of God's grace. Well, wait a minute. What is he talking about here? He's now transitioning, and he's going to come back to his first thought in verse 1 in verse 14. And you can see it in verse 14 because he uses the same three words. In verse 14, he says, for this reason. So Paul, it's like he, he diverts away from his initial prayer, and then he's going to come back to the prayer. He's going to finish the prayer in verses 14 through uh, 20, so we won't get to that until the weeks to come. But now he's, he's going to talk about his job, and that's to make the mystery known, to make the mystery known. Um, God's, God has graciously revealed a mystery to Paul. That's the theme of this passage. So here's the big question. What is the mystery? What is the mystery? Jews and Gentiles brought together as one man, as we saw last week in chapter 2. One people, the church, that's the end of chapter 2. So this union of Jews and Gentiles together, very different groups who hated each other, this union of bringing them together in Christ as one new people, one race of the saved people, we talked about that last week, this group this idea of bringing them together was unknown before. It was, uh, it was unthinkable even for many people. It was a mystery. It was a mystery. But now Paul makes it known. Let's look at verse 4. Look at verse 4. By reading this, you are able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. Now, I love verse 4 because 
It reminds us that Ephesians was a letter that was read aloud to a gathering of believers. And when this was read aloud, Paul hopes that they will understand this mystery, that Christ came to bring Jews and Gentiles together to form a third people group, neither really Jew nor Gentile, but redeemed the church. So in, in Paul's other letter to the church in Colossae, we see another letter in, that's a parallel with Ephesians. Paul describes this mystery. So look at Colossians 1.27. Paul says, God wanted to make known among the Gentiles the glorious wealth of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So this is true of us who are believers in Christ. If you are redeemed, if you are a Christian, Christ is in you, and you have the hope of glory. That's everything that, that means everything for our lives. That means we don't live for this world. We live ultimately for the world to come. We don't pin our hopes on this, our present circumstances, even if they're difficult. We don't pin our hopes on our present circumstances, but on the eternal living hope that we have in Christ. It's an already but not yet kingdom. We already have it, but it's not yet. It's not fu totally fulfilled. Christ in you, the hope of glory. We can live differently in this world because we have Christ in us. He is the hope of glory. And this truth, Paul's making a point of this, this truth has been made known to the Gentiles. Those who were not God's people have become God's people. Look at verse five. This was not made known to people in other generations. This mystery was not made known to people in other generations as it is now revealed to his holy apostles and the prophets by, and prophets by the Spirit. So what was he saying here? Up to this point, this mystery, this was a mystery. It was not fully understood or anticipated. Now remember, Paul could not even have understood this mystery without it being revealed to him. We saw that in verse three. Even Paul couldn't figure it out. God had to reveal it to Paul in verse three. And here it is in verse five. We see specifically how this mystery was made known. Who, who got the decoder ring? <laughs> who figured this out? Who, who helps us figure it out? By the Holy Spirit. By the Spirit. You see that in verse five? By the Spirit. That's how this mystery is made known. Because he is the spirit of truth. He gives us he, he, he guides us into all the truth. He, he cracks the code for us. That's the Holy Spirit's job. He leads us. He teaches us. Now, you might say, okay, wait a minute. We'll just hold on a second. People in the Old Testament did have scriptures that indicated that Gentiles would be blessed. We see that in the Abrahamic covenant in, in uh, Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. The whole world will be blessed through you. Okay, so Gentiles are included in that. There's even passages in Scripture that pointed to the future inclusion of Gentiles within Israel. In Leviticus 19 and Deuteronomy 10 and 1 Kings chapter 8, we see it throughout the Old Testament. So what makes this a mystery? Me, uh, here, here's what one commentator says. P.T. O'Brien says, it is the manner of this joining together that was a mystery, the manner of it. We, we saw it in chapter two. One man, one new people in Christ. They are neither really Jew nor Gentile. They are the church. Here's another commentator, Benjamin Merkel. He says, there indeed was no indication that Jews and Gentiles would be joined together into the body of Christ. So it, the mystery is of the manner of Jews and Gentiles coming together. This was unknown until the Spirit of God revealed it. And even after, think about this, even after the Holy Spirit came in the book of Acts, the people still didn't understand the mystery. If they did, Paul wouldn't be in jail, right? Because the Jews rejected it. They're like, no. They we'll get to that, okay? So, Paul wouldn't even be in prison if they had fully understood this mystery because the Jews would have said, oh, the Gentiles, yes, they should be brought in. We were one with them. But no, there was this, no, the stiff arm, right? So Jews in this time, in Paul's day, likely thought this. Let me try to, this is what we can imagine. Jews would have thought this. Yes, Gentiles can come to God. They can be blessed. But they are, we are the first class 
they are second class. They're grafted in. So they must follow our laws and become Jewish like us to be Christians. Remember that? that? That happened as they were talking about this. They can come into God's kingdom, but as servants, not sons. They might have thought this. But no, Paul's saying no. There are no second-class citizens in God's kingdom. No Jews and Gentiles, only sons and daughters. One people, one race, one in Christ. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. So we see this really clearly. Look at verse 6. This is to to cast out all doubts. Look at this, verse 6. The Gentiles are co-heirs, members of the same body, and partners in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Well, that's pretty clear, isn't it? Whoa, are they, really? They're all of those things? I love how clearly verse 6 spells it out. Gentiles are, let's look at each one. Gentiles are first co-heirs. They're co-heirs. They will receive all the rights and benefits of being, being God's children. They will receive the kingdom in its fullness. Gentiles are also children of Abraham. Would have blown the minds of the Jews. That's what it says in Romans chapter 4, verse 16. Gentiles are children of Abraham. What? They are, according to Romans 8, 17, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. F.F. Bruce, oh, rather, I'm, I'm jumping ahead of myself. So they are, they're co-heirs, co-heirs, that's number one. Number two, they are members, you see that in the text? Members of the same body, members. So this word members is susoma in Greek. This is a new word coined by Paul because no word could adequately describe the reality of Gentiles being members of the same body, the body of Christ, the church. F.F. Bruce says, he, he calls this membership a revolutionary concept. Here's what he says, Gentiles are the people of God on the same footing as Jews. Same footing. So they're co-heirs, they're members of the same body. Number three, they're partners. They're sharers of the promised, the promise in Christ. The promise in Christ. So what does that mean? What promise do they share? Simply, they share the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the epitome of God's promise. There is a clear example of this in Acts chapter 10. So Peter, who's a Jew, he, he sees this vision of bacon and sausage coming down from the sky and all God's people said, praise the Lord. You can eat this, right? Remember that whole vision? And then it leads him to a house filled with Gentiles, which talk about putting Peter out of his comfort zone, like, okay, I've seen sausage and bacon, and now I'm walking into a Gentile house. All these barriers are falling down. Like, I just can picture Peter. And he shares this good news. He got this, like, low-hanging fruit. These people are ready to hear the gospel. They're like, we need to hear the message you have to say. So Peter's like, okay. So he shares the message with these Gentiles. And look what happens in Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, verses 44 and 45. While Peter was still speaking these words... The Holy Spirit came down on all those who heard the message. The circumcised believers, who is that? That's the Jews. Circumcised believers who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. I like that word even. Like the the Holy Spirit didn't just get poured out on the Gentiles. Even on the Gentiles. There's a point there. Even on the Gentiles, that they, they, they share the same Holy Spirit as the Jews. They have the same Holy Spirit. They're on equal footing with the Jews. They are one in Christ. That's the mystery. It's revealed. So, so Paul's job is to make this mystery known. Here's, here's the third point in this message, verses 7 through 13. Why the mystery is made known. Why is it so important? Why is the mystery made known? There's two reasons. Two reasons. Number one, number one, for Christ's glory. For Christ's glory. Verses seven through nine. Now there's several parts to this. First, under for Christ's glory. First, it's not about Paul. It's not about Paul. It's very clear in verses seven 
to the beginning of verse 8. Let's look at the text, starting in verse 7. Paul says, I was made a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace that was given to me by the working of his power. This grace was given to me, the least of all the saints. And I want to stop there. We'll come back to the rest of verse 8. Again, we see grace as a theme here. Grace is at the forefront. Grace in verse 7, grace in verse 8. Grace is God's unmerited favor. It's a gift. And why does Paul need God's grace? Why does he need it? Because he is the least of all the saints, end of verse 8. You see that? The least of all the saints. So here in this verse, Paul creates a new word. He likes creating new words sometimes. He does it again here. He creates a new word to describe himself, and the word is leastest, or no, leaster, sorry, leaster. Leaster, literally the less than the least. That seems very, very little, right? R. Kent Hughes sums up Paul's attitude. He says, this is what Paul is saying. I am little by name, little in stature, and morally and spiritually littler than the least of all the Christians. <laughs> Why does Paul call himself this? Is he self-deprecating? No, it's sincere. Here's why. Because to Paul's shame, Paul formerly persecuted the church. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 9 and 10. He talks about this. He's like, I, I persecuted the church. I put Christians to death. I, I, I held the coats while Stephen was being stoned. He, he feels it. He's the least. He's... He's the worst. But the focus, here's the good news. The focus is not on Paul's failure, but on God's sufficient grace. Reminds me of the song that we sing here often. We sing, our sins, they are many. His, what? His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. It's true of us. Our sins, they are many. But his mercy's, mercy is more. This is the focus, God's grace and mercy. When we focus on who we were and what we did, we can find hope that God has shown his grace to us. We know it's not about us, right? We, we have to be reminded sometimes, but we know it's not about us, and it wasn't about Paul. In God's grace, Paul was chosen to be a servant of the gospel. We see that in verse 7. So the focus of Paul it's not, about, it's not about me. It's for Christ's glory. And what's the focus of his preaching? The preaching, uh, the preaching is it's about the riches of Christ. So that's the second point here. So it's not about Paul. It's about the riches of Christ. Look at the last half of verse 8. Uh, I love the language Paul uses here at the end of verse 8. He says, to proclaim to the Gentiles the incalculable riches of Christ. That's his goal in preaching. To proclaim to the Gentiles the incalculable riches of Christ. So this word incalculable could be translated inscrutable or incomprehensible. So what's the point? You can study and search and learn and you will never get to the bottom of the riches of Christ. Never. That's why we'll be in heaven forever and we'll never get to the bottom of the riches in Christ. He is everything there was an early 20th century Italian conductor named Tos Toscanini. Uh, I knew I wouldn't get it on the first try. Toscanini, okay. Uh, he once directed an orchestra concert, and after playing Beethoven, the audience went wild and cheered, even after several encores. Finally, after all the applause had died down, there was a lull, and Toscanini turned his back on the audience and he turned to his orchestra and he said this, I am nothing, you are nothing, but Beethoven, he is everything. Christ is incalculable. He is infinitely valuable. This is true. I am nothing, you are nothing, but Christ, he is everything. We gotta remember that. In Christ, we have all that we need. So here's the question. Is Christ everything to you? Is he the center of your life? Are you looking to him for all you need or are you looking somewhere else? 
We, we say this around here. Uh, if you have everything but Jesus, you have nothing. If you have nothing but Jesus, you have what? You have everything. You have everything. Everything in your life can be stripped away, but if you have Christ, you have everything. John Stott says this, Christ never impoverishes those who put their trust in him, but always immeasurably enriches them. Uh, Andrew Peterson wrote a song called All You'll Ever Need uh, some years ago. And here's the lyric from uh, the first verse. He says, the blood of Jesus, it's like the widow's oil. It's enough to pay the price to set you free. It can fill up every jar and every heart that ever beat. When it's all you have, it's all you'll ever need. When it's all you, you have, it's all you'll ever need. Do you believe this? This, this, is, this is everything for our lives. This means everything for our lives. Christ is enough. If you have him, you have all you'll ever need. This is the focus of Paul's preaching, the riches of Christ, because this is true wealth. This is wealth that goes beyond this life. Paul's preaching focuses on the riches of Christ, but it also, third, it, it focuses on illuminating the mystery. Illuminating the mystery, verse nine. Look at verse nine. And to shed light for all about the administration of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. So the mystery was the formation of the church. We talked about this, and they're neither really tr truly Jewish nor Gentile. They are a third people. Chapter two, verses 11 through 22. Here, here's what R. Kent Hughes says. We must realize that that dynamic evangelism will take place as we preach and live out two things, Christ and the church. Christ and the church. As believers in Christ, it is our job to shed light in dark places, in a dark world. We need to be bringing the gospel into dark places. The, the church is the hope of the world. And we talked about this in September. Who is the church for? The church is for the world. The church is for this dark world. We've been commissioned by Christ to go and make disciples of all nations. And this is not just the job of pastors or leaders. It is everyone's job. So everyone in this room, if you're a believer in Christ, it is your job to go out and bring light into a dark world. That's the priesthood of believers. Every one of us as believers in Christ, we are all ministers. We all have a ministry. So let me ask you, what's your ministry? What's your ministry? How are you shedding light in your world? It's not about Paul. It's about the riches of Christ, illuminating the mystery. And fourth, Christ is glorified in God's multifaceted wisdom. God's multifaceted wisdom, verse 10. Look at verse 10. This is so that God's multifaceted wisdom may now be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavens. Now, let's break this down a little bit. Multifaceted wisdom, that's an interesting phrase. Literally, it's many-colored wisdom, which, not surprisingly, is the same term used to describe Joseph's many coat, or many, ah, coat of many colors. Can't say it. Same word, same phrase. So God's many-colored wisdom is like Joseph's coat of many colors in Genesis 37. So God's wisdom is shown through his church. John Stott puts it well. He says, the church as a multiracial, multicultural community is like a beautiful tapestry. No other human community resembles it. Its diversity and harmony are unique. It is God's new society. That mystery revealed. Through God's wisdom, a new people has formed. God's people. And God's wisdom should be shown through the church to, you see in the phrase, what, what's next? To who? To the rulers and authorities in the heavens. Who are we talking about here? We've seen this term before, in the heavens. It's referring to the spiritual realm. So through the church, God's multifaceted wisdom is made known to spiritual beings. So 1 Peter 1 talks about this. 1 Peter 1, verses 10, 10 through 12 says, Our redemption in Christ, what God has done for us in Christ, is something into which angels long to look. 
They long to look. They're, they're peering into our lives as Christians, those, those who've been saved by grace through faith in Christ, and they just want to get a glimpse of God's manifold wisdom. So the angels long to look into it, but also it goes on the other side. The wisdom, this wisdom is also made known to demons, evil spirits. We, when we, listen, when we gather together as a diverse but unified body of Christ, we pose a threat to the gates of hell. How? How is that possible? It, we po- we po- well, I'll tell you in a second. But do you ever feel this way? Like that Sunday morning is a battle? Like just to get here? Just to gather together? Like, oh, there's, uh, I got an extra hour of sleep. I don't know how I'm going to make it. I mean, your kids, are, uh, they're upset, and they're, uh, they're trying to get them, get in the car. We're going to church. Be quiet. We're going to worship Jesus. Why does that happen? Why is there a battle on Sunday? Every other day seems fine because it's Sunday morning. Why is that? Because it's a battle. It's a spiritual battle. Satan hates it when we gather together and worship Christ. He hates it. Why? Here's what commentator P.T. O'Brien says. He says, The very existence of the church is a reminder to demons that the authority of the powers of hell has been decisively broken, and their final defeat is imminent. It's a reminder when we gather together that they have lost, and their time is running out. So the church, this group, the church is critical, it's vital, it's essential. This gathering is life-giving and essential for your walk with Christ, so let's not devalue it. Let's not think it's unimportant. It is so important. So this, this thought, well, you know, we'll just go when it's convenient. No, don't. You'll never come. God's multifaceted wisdom is made known through the church, through us. Not only when we gather, but also when we go out into the community. When we live out the gospel, when we live out the gospel, being the church outside the walls of this building, that's what the church does and is. So this mystery is made known first for Christ's glory. That's the first big point. Here's the second. It's for our joy. It's for our joy. Look at verses 11 and 12. This is according to his eternal purpose accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, Here it is. In him, we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. So here we see this phrase again. We've seen throughout Ephesians. In Christ Jesus, verse 11. In him, verse 12. That's union, speaking of union with Christ, being one with him. Being in Christ gives us the privilege we see here of bold and confident access to God. So we don't need to worry or wonder, will I be accepted? Yes, you're in Christ. If you're in Christ, you have full and free access to God and to eternity. That's the good news. Listen to uh, the author of Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews 4, 16 encourages us because of what Jesus did. Listen to Hebrews 4, verse 16. Let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and grace to help in time of need. Oh, I love that. Don't you love, do you need grace and mercy? Yeah? But you know what? Because you're in Christ, you can approach the throne of God with boldness, confidence. That's good news, church. When I was in high school, a senior in high school, I had the the opportunity, a really unique opportunity, to go to a Packers game as a member of the media. I'm I'm not making this up. I went as a press, as a member of the press. You're like, he's pulling our, you know, he's pulling our chain here. No, I really did. And I, I, were, I actually looked into my box of like Packers memorabilia to look for my press pass from that day. Because I got a press pass around my neck. It was this orange press pass. And it gave me access to the elevator that went to the press box. 
So why did I get this? Because I worked for a radio station when I was in high school, and the radio station got one press pass, and my job was to go and record the, uh, go to the game and record the, the after game press conference. And so I had a tape recorder. Yeah, that's how old I am. Uh, I had a tape recorder. There was no tweeting after the game. There was no, uh, you know. The, the, so so I, I'm there. This is 1997. And I'm sitting in the press box with all these TV people and these radio people and these newspaper people, and they're all sitting there. They know their thing. It's my first time. I've never done this before. And I walk up there, and I'm like, this is amazing because we have this box where we can see the field, and, and I had unlimited access to brats <laughs> and sides and drinks and cookies. I mean, I think I had like two brats, and uh, I mean, I was like, hey, free food. You know, that's just a UTech way. Uh, so I'm like eating all this free food, and, and then every quarter, they're, they're passing these packets of stats from the previous quarter. I'm like, what am I supposed to do with all these stats? Like, uh, but everybody gets some, and, and then the, the, as, the, as the game is going on, one of the things I knew I couldn't do was cheer. So in the press box, there's no cheering. Press is supposed to be unbiased. But I'm a Packers, I'm a high school kid, and I'm a big Packers fan. They had just won the Super Bowl the year before. So no, I was not allowed to take my title towel out and go, yeah, let's go. No, I wasn't allowed to do that. Um, do you remember this? <laughs> they could use this now. Don't they? <laughs> I, I wasn't allowed to cheer. Uh, and so I remember actually when there was an interception, Leroy Butler had two interceptions that game. And, I, and when he it caught a second interception, I, I get a little fist pump like this. I'm like, yeah. And then this guy came over to me and said, sir, there's no cheering in the press box. I'm like, <laughs> I not only had access to this amazing press box with all this free food, I had access to the locker room after the game. High school kid. Access to the locker room after the game. Brett Favre, Leroy Butler, Reggie White. The problem is, I couldn't find it. <laughs> I never made it to the locker room. Even though I had access, I could have gone, I never found it. I was like, we're, we're, this is a big place. <laughs> Where's the locker? I can't find it. So I ended up wandering into the, 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 the room where they had the press conference, you know, all the chairs and then the podium, and Bill Jarts is in there. Bill Jarts is working for the TV station back then, okay? And he's at the cameras, and I'm like sitting there by myself because all the other reporters are actual reporters, and they're interviewing players in the locker room, and I'm sitting in the, by myself, this kid. Like, I wonder what Bill Jarts thought of me. Like, who is this kid? <laughs> Why? He's got a press pass, right? So... He's like, hey, hey, could you, uh, could you go up to the podium and, and do a mic check for me? I was like, ha, ah, the podium where Mike Holmgren talks and Brett Favre, Reggie White. So I go up to the podium. I'm like, checking. One, two. So I stood at the Packers press conference podium and talked. Why? Because I had a press pass. It's the only reason I really didn't belong. I shouldn't have been there. And then I sat and I listened. I, Brett Favre walks in after the game, had a good game. He's inter doing the interview. I'm recording, you know, my one job. My one job. I recorded and I got it on tape, right? And then Leroy Butler comes in and like this, this, this uh, double-breasted like suit, you know? Like, I, the, like these are like bigger than life for me as a, as a high school student. So here's the question. Why did I, as a high school student, get such access. What was the reason? Because, because, of, because of me? Because I was special? Because I knew what I was doing? Absolutely not. Why did I have access? Because I had a press pass around my neck. And I never worried. Why, why, did, I, why did I have the press pass? Because I was in union with the radio station. That radio station gave me access. I, because I was in union, I was with, one with the radio station, I have this press pass that gave me unfettered access to all of these places and people. I, listen, I never worried I would be found out because my press pass was around my neck. It said I belonged. It said I'm welcome. Now, sadly, I didn't get to stay. They made me leave. <laughs> 
I didn't get to stay at Lambeau Field. I didn't get to live there, right? So he, here's, here's the point. The good news is this. Our union with Christ gives us a press pass to heaven that lasts not for one day, but forever. And we will never have to leave the party because it'll go on for eternity. And we don't get this privileged access to God based on our merits any more than I deserved my press pass in high school. No, we get eternal access to God only through what Jesus Christ did for us. So here's my question for you. Do you have your press pass? Do you have your press pass? It's not something you earn or deserve. It's paid for by the death of Christ on the cross for your sins. If you are not in Christ, if you're not in union with him, turn to him right now, wherever you are. And let's put it this way. If I asked you today, are you saved? What, what would you say? How would you respond? If you say, well, I'm really trying. I'm doing my best. That makes as much sense as if Bill Jarts asked me if I had a press pass and I said, well, I'm trying, Bill. I'm doing my best. No. <laughs> Either I have it or I don't. That's what salvation is like. Either you're saved or you're not. There's no trying. There's no doing our best. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. We're either saved or we're not. There's no middle ground. You either have been born again or you're still dead in your sins, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Salvation is not accomplished by us. Salvation is only accomplished by Christ at the cross. He has given you access to God. So here's the question. If you have not turned to Christ, if you've not believed on him alone for salvation, what should you do? Romans 10, 9 and 10 is really clear. It says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. So maybe for you today is the day that you turn to Christ. You confess him as Lord and Savior and you put your faith alone in him. Well, Paul comes full circle in his passage in verse 13. Look at verse 13. So then, I ask that you not be discouraged over my afflictions for your, on your behalf, for they are your glory. So now, really, we've come back to where we started in verse 1. Paul is in prison for the sake of the Gentiles. His afflictions are for their glory, so he does not want them to be discouraged or to lose heart. So why do you think they would be discouraged? Why would they lose heart? Well, because Paul is suffering in prison. Now, if I'm Paul, I might be discouraged because my ministry has halted. Or has it? God has a purpose for Paul's suffering. And the purpose is the very letter to the church that we're reading today. Just think about that. If Paul had not been put in prison, would we have the book of Ephesians? So here's my point. God has a purpose for our suffering. God has a purpose for your suffering. You may not know it now, and you may not even know it in this lifetime. Paul may not have known it in this lifetime. But God has a plan. So may we learn to trust him even in the midst of suffering. So that ends this passage. We'll pick up next week in verse 14 where Paul returns to his prayer. But this revealed mystery has huge impl implications for our lives. We are made one in Christ. There are no second-class Christians, only sons and daughters of God, bought by the blood of Jesus. So how will we respond to this? We need to praise God for adoption, redemption, forgiveness of sins. Praise God for making us one in Christ. So as the church, let's follow him together. Let's trust him together. Let's worship him forever. That's a good response to this. Let's pray. Let's pray together. God, thank you for this time in your word today. God, you are so amazing. Your grace is so full we're so thankful that we have been given access to you, not just for a day, but for eternity. 
And we want to focus in on what Jesus did for us as he died on the cross, the sacrifice that was made for us by taking communion today. And so we pray that you would speak to our hearts as we continue to be quiet before you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.